as I was thinking about this service and being a new year and what that really meant to me, what I was hoping for in a new year. There was a verse in Romans chapter 5 that just brought it all together for me. And that's where we're going to be camping out today is Romans chapter 5. And uh, we've been studying Romans in our youth group and just kind of going chapter by chapter and just breaking it down so we have an understanding of... uh, of really of the gospel message. You know, that Paul in Romans, he, he lays out the gospel in such an eloquent form. It's hard to follow sometimes, but it is in depth and it's deep and he packs so much in there. And as I, as I was preparing for next week's youth group lesson in Romans chapter 5, I had this terrible time getting through the first two verses. Oh, yes, and we are going to uh, dismiss the buckaroos because we forget to do that around here. (laughs) Maybe this year I'm going to put a note up here that says dismiss buckaroos. I like it. We should have done that last year. But verses 1 and 2 in chapter 5 of Romans, and we're going to read them both, but we're not going to have time to really get into verse 2, because what we're going to be talking about today is the peace with God. What is peace with God? So if you'll uh, join me in Romans chapter 5, we're going to read verses 1 and 2 just to get us an idea uh, of what's going on, but we're going to be camping out in Romans 5 verse 1, and he says, therefore... Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. I just want you to be thinking about what that means to you. And we're going to explore that here in just a minute. And he goes on, he says, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Um, There's two things that Paul says that we have been given because of our justification here. And one is peace, in which we're going to discuss today. And the other is access into grace. And hopefully in the future times when we have some time together, we'll be exploring a little bit of more of God's grace and, and what that means for us. But today we're going to focus on peace. Now, previously in, to this, in Romans chapter 4, Paul takes up the entire chapter to explain that it is only by faith that we are justified. Right? Only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are we declared righteous before God. And Paul uses Abraham and the events in his life as an example of this. Right? To help explain to us. And Even though everything in Abraham's life pointed to the fact that God could not do what God said he was going to do, Abraham believed in anyways. I mean, if you think about it, God told Abraham, he says, you're going to have a kid. You are going to have an heir. Right? And, and through this heir, all nations will be blessed. Right? Now, Sarah and Abraham, they're pushing 100 years old. Right? I mean... I mean, when God said, I mean, Sarah even laughed. She's like, that ain't going to happen. Right? They tried to take things into matters into their own hand, just fouled things up a little bit more. But Abraham constantly believed that God would do what God said he was going to do. So he had faith, right? He believed what God said. He believed he would do what God was saying he would do. And he lived his life according to this belief. That is faith. He had faith in God. So, and because of this faith, God considered Abraham as being righteous. 
See, Paul sums it up like this. If we jump back just a few verses to chapter 4 and verse 22 and pick it up there, he says, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. So the fact that Abraham believed God, God accounted it to him as righteousness, right? And he goes on, he says, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So this righteousness through faith is for, is for those who believe that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for sin and was raised from the dead so that we can stand guiltless before a holy God. That, Right? We have been justified. And Paul says, if you believe that and have made Jesus your Lord, then you are in right standing with God. But the point behind all this is that you can't do anything on your own to achieve this righteousness. Right? It's not by works. You can't rely on anyone else's faith. Your grandma's prayers may save your hide a time or two, but they ain't going to get you to heaven. I don't care how good a praying she is. The only thing that puts you in right standing with God is faith in the Lord Jesus. And I think that most of us have a pretty good grasp of this. I mean, that, that is why we're here for the most part. Now, we may have problems applying that to our life. We may have some of you in here who are still toying with the idea of surrendering your life to Jesus. It, it, it comes down to you know, you're, you're kind of walking around the fringes. You want to make sure it's real, right? We've all been there. We've all had to make that decision where, where we, we sat back and we looked and we went, man, is this really real? Is this real for me? Is this going to work in my life? Is this God the God of my life too? Each and every one of us have had to make that decision. But we all have, I think, a pretty good idea or, or, or grasp that it's not what we do. It's what Jesus did for us, right? So, so Paul says, because of this justification, this new status that you have been given, you have some things at your disposable, this, yeah, disposal that you didn't have before. Right? I mean, it, it's like it's like buying a condo. You move in, you get all your stuff moved in, you're unpacked, you walk out the back door and find out it has a pool. It's an amenity. Right? And it's the same thing as kind of what's going on here. We bought into Jesus. Right? We made him Lord. And Paul's saying, hey, there's some amenities to go along with this. Right? He says, now the first of these amenities that Paul lays out for us, he says that you have peace with God. Okay, so we're going to spend a few minutes here and we're going to try to wrap our heads around what it is to have peace with God. So if I asked 10 of you what your idea of peace was, it's very conceivable that we would come up with maybe 10 different answers, right? Because your definition of peace is going to be directly related to your perspective, or where you're coming from, or what you view peace to be. If we were to take, say, peace on a large scale, right, if, uh, this huge view of peace, it would be the lack of conflict, right? A world peace, we think no war. Um, if we had peace on a global scale, there would, scale, there would be no military conflict, uh, you know, terrorists wouldn't be running over people in Christmas markets or blowing people up. There would be no ISIS. There would be no Al-Qaeda because we would have peace, world peace, right? And that's one view of peace. That's a very large view of peace. Well, let's bring this a little closer to home. On a national level, you realize we just went through a very heated election cycle, Right? Where not only were the Republicans against the Democrats, but we had Republicans against Republicans, and I'm not sure who was exactly against who. It seems like everybody was against everybody. And if you watch the news, I'm not even sure it's over yet. 
right? I mean, we, it, it revealed to us how divided we are. I mean, we had two completely different ideologies come head to head, right? It's been building, we've all seen it build this, these two different ideologies that are in our country right now, right? And we've, for years, we've watched it build and we've watched it build and we've watched it build and we've sat behind the scenes and we've said, man, that, that could be ugly for us. Oh, I don't like the way that's going, right? And we knew it was coming, right? And it came to a head, right? And it showed, the, what it really showed is the divisiveness that we have in this country. We are not a unified people. So on a national level, we could view peace as national pride and maybe unity among the people. I mean, if you think about it, 2016 was an extremely unpeaceful year as a country. I mean, we had, it was chaotic. Uh, not only did we have the elections, but, you know, we had violent protests in, in most of our major cities, and in many of our major cities, there were protests. Not all of them made the news. But, I mean, even in Denver, there were protests. There's something that we don't normally have, at least in my lifetime. I have never really lived through a, a, such a chaotic time in our country. And this, that's why, you know, as I was reading this, I kept thinking, man, we need peace. We just need peace in our country. What about our police officers? Do you realize a war was declared on, on our officers? I mean, they are being targeted. And, and assassinated. I mean, ambushed. It's crazy. I've got a brother-in-law who, who is a, a police officer in Denver area. I mean, and, and he has to deal with the, uh, the, the strip clubs, the bars, and, and don't think that we don't pray for him on a daily basis. The things, the stories that we hear that he has to go through, the fear that he has every time that he goes to work. It, it, he hates the night shift. It's not fun to be working at 3 o'clock in the morning when the bar's closed. Right? We need to be praying for our, the men and women in this country who put their lives on the line for us. Man, to have peace. I mean, if you think about it, we can't even watch a football game without controversy. Right? I mean, <laughs> Sunday afternoon used to be football time for the whole country. I mean, the NFL was the biggest thing around. And now, we don't even know what team they're playing on. We're not talking about football here. We don't even know where they're at. We are so incredibly ununified as a nation. Oh, we need to pray for peace. Well, let's bring this on in, though. And not just only on a local level where peace may be considered a lack of crime or maybe just a good economy, right? I mean, that brings peace. What about, what is, what is peace to you personally, on a personal level? Um, you know, if you've ever been in an abusive relationship, or maybe been in a situation where you didn't feel you could keep your children or your family safe, Right, then peace to you probably is going to revolve around having safety and security. Knowing that you're in a good environment and not having to worry about who or what is going to harm you next. That's peace. Or maybe if you've ever been without work or a period of time that maybe you've been homeless and seriously struggling, then you know, there's peace in having a stable job and a place to live and something to eat. That's peaceful. Your idea of peace might include stability and prosperity. <laughs> I'm going to pick on my brother-in-law, Danny. He's sitting back there in the back. <laughs> See, Danny has a unique problem. He doesn't even know I'm going to talk about him, so this ought to be fun for all of us. Danny has had a unique problem over the years that I have found almost comical. He probably doesn't. 
But see, Danny's problem is no matter where he lives, he seems to live next to a neighbor who plays his stereo really, really loud. (laughs) This started when Danny was 19. I've known him for a long, long time. We grew up together, we worked together, we started a business together. At 19 years old, about three o'clock in the morning, they're coming home from the bar, Stereos are going crazy, and Danny's standing out in the middle of the street in his underwear yelling at him to turn the stereo down. It was awesome. <laughs> right, so, so uh, everywhere Danny goes, he seems to have this neighbor that is just drives him nuts. He lived in this duplex apartment thing where he had a guy above him one time. Guy played his TV so loud that it would vibrate through the floor, you couldn't hear nothing. It was, it was terrible. <laughs> and he's back there shaking his head, but it was hilarious. <laughs> so to Danny, peace might just be silence. Man, when you say well, peace, man, Danny's got this idea of sitting on a lake up on the mesa with no noise. Silence, that's peace. And then we have this idea that there can be peace between individuals. Where we are living and working in harmony with others, or even working for the good of others. Uh, The best example of this is the marriage union between man and wife. Right? Where where we uh, seek such harmony that we can operate as one flesh towards the same goals in the same manner. To be united like that, uh, that brings incredible peace. So, with all these possibilities of peace, how are we to view having peace with God? Well, first of all, God's peace is all encompassing. I mean, if you think about it, you are now part of the family of God, a member of the body of Christ. You belong to something. That brings unity and harmony into your life. You belong to the group of people that are sitting here. We are accountable to one another. We encourage one another. We lift each other up. We mourn with each other. As a church, we are mourning. We do this together. We belong. We have unity. What about if, what about the prosperity side of peace? When you think about the prosperity that brings peace, scripture tells us that God provides for us from his riches in glory. According to his riches in glory. That's a wealth that we don't even understand. I mean, he paves the streets with gold and uses love as a currency. Uh, That's something that, I mean, we have a pretty hard time wrapping our heads around that. But if you're worried about prosperity, he uses gold as paving material. And And the Bible says that he will provide for you according to his riches. Those are riches that we don't understand, that we don't possess. Psalms 91, verses 1 and 2. It says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadows of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I will trust. He is our fortress. God is our safety. We, we talked about having peace in safety. God is our safety. He is our fortress. And then John 14, verses 2 and 3, that speaks to the stability that we can have through the peace with God, right? He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. He says, I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you can be also forever with Jesus. That is a stable environment. That's what we're seeking. 
that peace, that stability. In Colossians 1, verses 20 and 21, Paul confirms that our justification has in fact ended our conflict against God. Let me read that to you real quick. It's a powerful verse. Colossians chapter 1. Verses 20 and 21, he says, And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus made peace through his sacrifice on the cross. And he goes on, he says, And you, once you were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled you. You see, he says, you have been reconciled. It is, this is almost a peace of reconciliation. This all-encompassing peace is brought and given to us through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, but there's one more side of this peace. See, the Greek word Paul uses here for peace can also be translated peace of mind. It, pa- having peace of mind is crucial in our lives. You know, when you think about it, when we have peace of mind, we are encouraged and empowered by this feeling that we are right. Right? And we can do, we can face hardships and hurts and problems with grace when we have peace of mind with what we're doing. Uh, If you think about when I was thinking about an example, Martin Luther King Jr. came to mind. Because if you think about it, here's a man who carried a message and he knew he was right. I mean, he knew the word of God. He knew that the hatred and the racism was dead wrong. He had peace of mind that his message was right, that it was good, that it was true. And that empowered him to face the dangers that he faced. Did he know it would end up the way it, was, it ended up? I don't know that. But I think that he, he was, had peace of mind that if it came to that, his message was still true and his message was still good and his message still needed to be heard. He had peace of mind that he was in the right. That he was, he knew in his heart that he was morally right. And when we know that, we can face enormous hardships. I mean, each and every one of you have known somebody or maybe had to stand up for what you believe in against everyone else. Because you had the peace of mind of knowing that what you were doing was right. Paul had peace of mind that came because of his trust in Jesus. That's how he could write this. He says, I got all excited. Turned my notes the wrong way. (laughs) Oh. But Paul was empowered to take the gospel message to every place he took it to because he had peace of mind in knowing who God was. He had a peace of mind that in his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he had peace with God. This peace with God is that all-encompassing peace that just brings unity and harmony together, that empowers us. You see, Paul, Paul is not informing us about this peace we have with God so that we can have warm, fuzzy feelings while we sit secure on our couches and watch the Bronco game. That's not what peace of God is for. You see, he's telling us all of the benefits of peace with God because he knows that with your justification, when you were justified before a holy God, 
you were put at odds against the world. You can't have it both ways. So this peace with God creates conflict with the world. And that's why peace, that's why Paul is reassuring us about the peace of God. You see, there's a war going on right now for the hearts and minds, for the souls of men and women. And your justification moved you into the front lines. It is kind of like you've been drafted. But Paul's saying that we can have peace of mind in knowing that our God is bigger than anything the world can throw at us. And really, isn't that the bottom line? Isn't that really what we're all struggling to figure out? That we're all asking, God, are you big enough to handle this? I mean, throughout, throughout the Bible, we read of these great patriarchs of our faith who address that question. Look at it. Genesis chapter 15. This isn't even in notes. This is a freebie. Genesis chapter 15, this is amazing. Let me find it real quick. He says, God is talking to Abraham, 15 verse four, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but the one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to them, so shall your dependents be. So God is telling Abraham, that I'm going to give you all this. And then he said to, huh, I lost it. Abraham asked God, Abraham asked God, he says, how big of a reward can you give me considering I have no heir? See, that's what brought this conversation up. God says, I am your exceedingly great reward. And Abraham says, how great can your reward be if it ends with me? Right, that was Abraham's question. How big are you? You've not given me an heir. So, how big of a God are you? If I don't have an heir and you're promising me that I'm going to bless all nations through my heir, but you haven't given me an heir, I'm 100 years old, how big of a God are you? Can you really do this? Can you really protect me? Can you really give me peace? Isn't that what we're all considering today? That's the struggle that we go through in this life is we're constantly looking to God and we're, we want to be reassured that God is that big, that he can handle it, that he's bigger than death, that he's bigger than sin, that he's bigger than this world. Abraham put his faith in God. Paul put his faith in the fact that Jesus died for him. And that peace that comes from knowing that our God is big enough to raise Jesus from the dead, he's big enough to raise us from the dead because of our faith in Jesus. He's that big. That big. He can take, he can, God's bigger than anything. I want to leave you with a scripture out of Romans 8. Romans 8, chapter, verses 38 and 39. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul puts that in there because these are the things that are going to come after you. These are the things that you are at odds with. Life and death and principalities and powers and things you can't see and things you can see. The whole world. And God's big enough to protect you through all of it. 
He's big enough to give you that peace, that peace of mind and knowing that your future is secure through Christ. He's really that big. I guarantee it. He's that big in my life. He's that big in your life. Just look back at the things he's done. Look forward to the things he's going to do. We've got years and years and years of history, not only in this book, but in our lives that prove that God is faithful, that God does what he says he's going to do and God's big enough to take care of you. So if you have any doubt, any wonder, I want to let you know today that when you make Jesus your Lord, you have peace with God. That's an all-encompassing peace that cannot be taken from you. Nothing can separate you from the love of your God. Nothing. Let's pray. Father, we seek your peace today. Lord, we we seek an understanding of your peace that we could operate more boldly because we know that our future is secure, that you provide. Lord, that you're bigger than anything that we can come across. And we just thank you. Lord, I pray that if there are any out there today who do not know your peace, who don't have a peace of security in knowing that you are our future, I pray that you would just work on their hearts right now to reveal yourself to them. And I want to give you that opportunity if you don't have that peace of knowing that your future is secure in Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity right now to know that you're secure for all time. If you haven't made that commitment and you want that peace with God, I'm going to ask you to just slip up a hand so I can pray with you this morning. Or maybe, yes, yes, I see your hand. Thank you, Lord. We struggle with peace, God. Oh, we struggle so much with peace. We focus on the turmoil around us instead of the goodness that you have provided for us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us, as Paul says, to refresh our minds, to lean into you and to focus on the good the good of you instead of the turmoil and the the chaos around us. Lord, help us to seek you. And Lord, I know that you are faithful, God, and that as as we push into you and we rely upon you, Lord, I know that your peace will just flood over us. Oh, you are a loving God and we thank you. Father, I just thank you for the hand that was raised. Lord, what a joyous occasion to know that another one of us has joined with you in eternity. That that decision has been made in a heart that we will chase you, that we will seek after you, that we will follow after you no matter what because our future is secure in you alone. Oh, we praise you, Lord Jesus. I ask that you would just help us to realize your peace in our lives this week. Lord, as we begin 2017 and we, we look forward not only in our lives and in our jobs and the things that we have to do, but we look forward to what you are going to do through us. And we just give you praise for that, Lord. I ask that you would just be a blessing 
a God of comfort to each and every person who is here today. And in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you all for coming out. And before you leave today, get a hold of somebody, tell them you're going to be praying for them, and then do it. God bless you.